May I also request Ms. Segal, Baba, Chief Justice Menon and Justice Sikri to come up on the stage. May I now request Anina to come up on stage and we, it's a tradition here, we don't give flowers because they are always die the next day, we always give a nice plant and this year we have a poinsettia and Anina will be giving it to Yoga. And Gauri to Justice Sikri. And Anina to Chief Justice Menon. Miss Nentara Segal, who will deliver who will deliver this year's memorial lecture, Justice Sikri, Chief Justice Menon, Ms. Kiran and Mr. James Valiath of the NAS Foundation, judges, lawyers, social activists, students, and members, and representatives of the media, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I welcome you to the 24th Just Memorial Justice Sunanda Bhandari Memorial Lecture this evening. Since 1995, the Justice Sunanda Bhandari Foundation has been organizing an annual lecture on issues that were close to my grandmother's heart, particularly gender justice, human rights, child rights and women's rights, and the rights of differently abled persons. In the past, distinguished persons like the late Justice V. R. Krishnayar, the late Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam, Professor Amartya Sen, Mrs. Sonia Gandhi, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and Nobel Laureate Kailash Satyarthi have delivered topics on have, de have delivered lectures on different topics. Last year, Mr. Ramachandra Guha, an eminent historian, delivered the 23rd Justice Sunanda Bhandare Memorial Lecture on Patri Patriotism versus Jingoism. This year, this last year, the foundation has held numerous legal awareness camps for women in collaboration with the Sar Nirman Educational and Cultural Society and the All India Association for Women and Children Development at the Community Centre Sarai Basti Shastri Nagar on July 5th and with IMS Law College Noida on September 4th. Another legal awareness program, mainly for visually challenged girls and women, was conducted at the Dolitram College, New Delhi, in collaboration with the enabling unit of the college in September. The foundation has fought a long-standing litigation in the Supreme Court to ensure the practical and effective implementation of the law for persons with disabilities 
and especially the 2016 Act, which has come replacing the 95 one. The Honorable Supreme Court, in its order dated 18 September, directed the Chief Secretaries of the States and Union Territories to furnish affidavits of compliance, showing the compliance and the full and effective implementation of the Act. Our speaker this evening, Ms. Segal, is a renowned writer, widely known for her novels, A Time to be Happy, This Time of Mourning, and Storm in Chandigarh. Her memoirs, Prison and Chocolate Cake, and From Fear Set Free, provide an interesting insight to her life and work. For her novel, Rich Like Us, she received the Sahitya Academy Award for English in 1986. And in 2015, she returned the award as a mark of protest against the increasing intolerance in the country and to voice her support for citizens' right to dissent. Last month, she received the Lal Dead National Award 2018. The topic for today's lecture is women under religious fundamentalism, which has acquired great significance in the context of today's climate of intolerance. I welcome you, Ms. Segal, and we all look forward to your lecture. One of the more glaring examples of the subjugation of women is the manner in which they are mistreated by their own religious community, whether that be the right to pray to a deity of a temple or at a mosque, or through the objectification of women in scripture, religion has created a stark divide between men and women. The inclusivity of women in religion is a cause that is being fought today, and women are taking control of their rights and seizing the opportunity to demand equality. An equality that should have been their inherent fundamental and moral right. I accord a warm welcome to Justice Sikri, Judge of the Supreme Court of India, who has kindly agreed to grace the occasion as our chief guest. I also welcome Justice Menon, Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court, who is presiding over our function. I accord a warm welcome to the recipients of this year's Justice Sunanda Bhandare Award, the Nas Foundation Trust, who is represented today through Ms. Kiran and Mr. James Valiath for their tireless fight towards granting every citizen of India the basic right to love and be free. Last but not least, I welcome you all, whose unstinted support has encouraged us and motivated us to carry forward the work my grandmother had started. Welcome. May I now request Justice Sikri to come and give the opening remarks. Thank you. Good evening to all of you present here. Mr. Nain Tara Saigalji, Chief Justice of Delhi High Court, Justice Menon, our very beloved Mr. Muli Bandare, all the eminent people sitting of the dais, including our former Prime Minister, Mr. Ashok Desai, partner of, uh, was once partner of Justice Sunda Bandare, Mr. P.H. Parikh, the learned ASG, other very senior advocates, ladies and gentlemen. I am given this pleasant talk, a task of saying something about Justice Sunanda Bandare, in whose memory this lecture series is organized. Let me start with what Raymond Chandler has said. I only make one change because in his words he describes the person as man and have substituted that with women. And I quote, down these mean streets, a woman must go who is not herself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. She's the hero. She's everything. She must be a complete woman and a common woman, and yet, an unusual woman. She must be, 
to use a rather weathered phrase, a woman of honor. By instinct, by inevitability, without thought of it, and certainly without saying it. She must be the best woman in her world and a good enough woman for any world. I thought that these are the best words which describe the personality of Justice Sunanda Bhandara. She was born on November 1, 1942. And if you remember, 1942 is the year when Quit India Movement started. So she was a freedom child, so to say. And above all, she was daughter of a veteran freedom fighter, Mr. H.R. Gokhale. So she saw not only she was a freedom child by birth, but the spirit of freedom was inculcated in her from her childhood when she saw her father fighting for the freedom of the country. So I think this is one reason that she really understood the meaning of freedom, which, and many freedoms now, which are part of fundamental rights in our constitution under Article 19, apart from other fundamental rights which are given in Chapter 3 of the constitution. And what I perceive is that this went a long way when she discharged her function as a judge, and before that, even as an advocate. Different jurists have perceived the concept of justice in a different manner. There are various jurisprudential talk about the concept of justice. I think the literature which is written on what justice is, it would surpass any other aspect of law. But for her, there was a simple meaning which should be assigned to justice. No doctrinaire approach, a very common sense approach. That is what I have gathered from her personality. For her, it was not necessary to go into the jurisprudential or theoretical aspects of justice. As I have seen her functioning as a judge, I would say that the simple meaning of justice which she conceptualized was to give a person his or her right which is legitimately due to that person. What is that is involved in a case and where the justice lies, whether a particular claim made by that person is due to him or not, or her or not. And then she'll find ways to do that justice. So this, I feel, that made her more pragmatic, practical and common sense approach which she adopted in her cases. It made her truly justice-oriented judge. And this quality of perceiving justice in this sense, I feel imbibed in her or inculcated in her a very, very strong sense of justice. We have seen over a period of time now a judge for almost 20 years and all the eminent advocates and jurists sitting here know that we have different kind of judges and in different contexts they can be categorized. We have activist judges and in contradistinction uh, we may have those on the other side will say that those judges who exercise judicial restraint I'm not talking of that context. In other context, we have seen that there are judges who are very pragmatic, and there are judges who are very legalistic. 
a legalist judge will go by in his or her perception by the letter of law and will say that what is this in a way a dry letter of law commands me i am going to do that a pragmatic judge on the other hand will try to find a solution which is justice oriented let us be frank about it and there is no now debate that judges make law and we also know what i call discretionary justice there are so many areas where the judge can exercise her discretion and decide the matter accordingly by adopting a justice oriented approach and in this category the judges who are pragmatic judges they fall and justice sunanda bhandare belong to this particular category because she knew that judge justice is pregnanted with mercy there cannot be any justice unless we keep the mercy apart and it is linked with empathy so therefore when it came to deciding those cases as was pointed out to you for giving social justice the cases for marginalized section of the society the cases pertaining to women who are harassed lot the cases of disabled the cases of other deprived classes so here she had a heart at a right place and she was a truly pragmatic judge who knew where justice lies and she could by her common sense approach discern that i have seen myself i was a young advocate at that time in the court who appeared before her number of times and of course while waiting for your case you witness how other cases are going on and only one motto only one uh, uh, the focus was only on one thing that how i can do justice in this case that is how i can give the person her legitimate due which she is entitled to and once she would find that then thereafter she knew how it is to be administered and that was the best quality which a judge can have and that is why she was known as a humane judge at the same time she was very popular with the bar particularly the young bar as young judges maybe i was not that very young little uh, older but the young bar who were new entrants would call that bench which she presided a mother bench she was known as this mother bench that that shows if this is the label given by the bar and bar is the best judge of judges then you can understand what is the respect she commanded as a judge it was i can say that she had combined five c's which is character caliber compassion courtesy and courage and three i's independence integrity and industry and these 5 plus 3 they i think encompass her entire personality as a judge and make her a wonderful outstanding judge we ever had in delhi high court it is unfortunate though she was the senior most punya judge at that time that at the age of 52 her outstanding career came to a screeching halt when she died of cancer and otherwise what i feel and going simply by seniority 
not any other consideration, she would have been the first Chief Justice of India. Of course, we still have to see some other lady judge comes and occupies that position in near future. But I tell you only my personal experience, I think I have not shared, maybe except with few persons who are very close to me. She called me once in a chamber and she said, are you ready to accept judgeship? I smiled and I told her I am only 38 years of age. She said, oh, I didn't know that you have matured too fast, <laughs> but you will have to wait for two years because we should have a person at least of 40 years. It's a different thing. When I turned 40, then the minimum age was 42. When I turned 42, then the minimum age was 45. <laughs> so I could become judge only at the age of 45. But that apart, I'm just telling that how she could pick up the people also. And uh, I may say, sum up by saying this, that she practiced all her life, what I'm going to read now. Your kindness may be treated as your weakness. Still be kind. Your help to others may go unnoticed and unneeded, unheeded. Still be helpful. If you are honest and frank, People may cheat you, still be honest, because it's been between you and God. It was never between you and them. This is, was her personality, and we are really happy that her family has not allowed it to, that she should be forgotten. We remember her every year in memorial lectures. Apart from that, the trust is doing human service, as this year only they're going to give award to NAS Foundation, and they're doing so much for disabled persons as well. So Mr. Bandare, I really admire you. There are very few husbands who would do such, uh, I mean, show such an act for their wives. We have come here to listen to uh, Nayantara Sahagalji. I was told, therefore I am although wanted to say something about the topic, but I was told, no, you speak only about IEG. So I am, uh, with this, uh, I am going to sit so that we are able to hear a very, very illuminating ta uh, talk which is going to be delivered. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justice Sikri, for something that is so personal, and that's why that's how we remember Aya always. Uh, may I now request Ms. Segal to give the 2018 Justice Sunanda Bhandare Award to the NAS Foundation, and may I please request Uh, Ms. Kiran and Mr. James Valier to come up on stage to accept it. In appreciation of its sustained campaign on equal rights for all, its remarkable work in advocacy, empowering girls, and ensuring their capacity building, its determined efforts at giving adolescent girls a better life, its participation in programs aimed at addressing the issues of HIV AIDS, its consistent endeavor in educating the public about the prevention of transmission of HIV, and its petition first in the Delhi High Court and then the curative petitions and interventions in the Supreme Court of India that resulted in the eventual decriminalization of Section 377, which have gone a long way in ensuring equal dignity for all, the Justice Sunanda Bhandari Foundation bestows the 2018 award on the NAS Foundation.
Unfortunately, Ms. Gopalan could not be here today, so her colleagues are, are accepting the award on behalf of the NAS Foundation. May I now request Ms. Segal to come up and deliver the 24th, the 24th Justice Sunanda Bhandari Memorial Lecture. Where would you would you prefer? Oh, now it's working. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, yeah, a little back, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, the title of my talk, as you've been told, is Women Under Religious Fundamentalism. When Murli Dharji asked me to deliver this lecture in his wife's memory, I was intimidated by the long list of eminent speakers who had gone before me. But I accepted because these lectures are in memory of a woman who made a distinguished mark in a man's world. We live in a conservative, medieval-minded patriarchy. The majority of women in this country are not allowed to make decisions that intimately concern them, like marriage or giving birth. The majority of women do not own or handle money even if they are themselves earning it. They don't own their bodies, and they are not in control of their lives. The abuses they may suffer in their homes remain secret and unreported for fear of the consequences if they speak out, or social stigma, or fear of the police. Many women who are privileged and in a position to strike out, don't do so. They are content to remain protected by privilege in return for recognizing that it's a man's world. Sunanda Bhandare accepted no limitations, and she was supported by a family that took pride in her ambition and in her achievements. She achieved the heights in her chosen profession which incidentally is a profession that is much in need of women. And she would have gone on to greater distinction if illness had not tragically cut short her life. I've been struck by two statements of hers. One defines her position on the meaning of a judge's role in a developing society. And the other statement is her view on the very meaning of civilization, on what a judge's role should be. This is what she said. In developing societies, judges can be the sentinels of progress. This interpretation of justice and of judges as guardians of progress is crucial to any society, but more especially to a developing society. Laws can light the way ahead to take a country forward for human betterment. <coughs> but they will remain pieces of paper unless they are upheld in judgments, and unless judges stand guard over them. On the meaning of civilization, this is what she said. A woman's place in society marks the level of civilization. Well, to put it differently, a society is only as civilized as the way it treats its women. No society has the right to call itself civilized 
unless its women's citizens have the same rights and freedoms as men have. So let me begin by saluting the woman for whom justice in general and gender justice in particular was crucial for progress and whose memory we are honoring here today. According to her view of what civilization means, India in 2018 is a country that does not deserve to be called civilized. The enlightened vision of our founding fathers who established gender equality at independence, overturning centuries of injustice by establishing equality in law, and who aspired to give women their equal and dignifi dignified place in society at long last. That vision has degenerated into an environment where, <coughs> where India is now seen <coughs> as the most dangerous country for women. We don't need foreign observers to tell us this. It is a fact that Indian women and even little girls are not safe in the home, on the street, or in the workplace. And gender injustice is much too weak a phrase to apply to this shameful state of affairs. Added to the hangover of persisting age-old injustices and crimes against women, there is now a climate of lawless mob violence, which of course targets men as well as women and children. But it is emboldened by a fundamentalist mindset that is the subject of my talk. But although this mindset endangers all citizens, women are its special targets and its worst sufferers. It has made life specially dangerous for them if we look at the rising graph of gang rapes. Rape is central to the mob violence which we see today. It is now an act that makes brutal use of women's bodies to humiliate and assert its power over an entire community. This prevailing climate is different from anything that we have seen in India before. It is not merely criminal or communal or divisive. It is a result of, and it has the authority of, a mindset, fundamentalist mindset, which has been given free reign by a political ideology. But before I get on to fundamentalism, let me explain what I think all true believers mean by religion. Religion is a relationship between a human being and God. All the men and women of every nationality and every religion whom we have revered as saints have held this view. A whole bhakti movement crossing religious frontiers has held this view. It is human beings who are in need of religion. A mountain does not have a religion. A tree does not have a religion. A block of land has no religion. Therefore, there is a nonsensical fallacy about giving land masses a religious identity and calling them a Muslim country or a Hindu country or a Jewish country. The nation state has no role to play in the intensely personal relationship between an individual and God. 
But this personal view of religion is thrown aside by fundamentalism. For the fundamentalist, the state, which is a political entity, rules over religion. Well, added to this fallacy of a nation giving itself a religion is the fact that religion everywhere has been boiled down into laws and rules made by men. The Manusmriti, which is considered a Dharma Shastra, it dates from around 200 BC, and it is believed to have been written by Brahmin males over a period of time. It leaves us in no doubt about its upper caste masculine authorship. Central to the laws it lays down about a how a society should be run is the inferior position that it gives to women, defining a woman's role as subservient to her husband and her only duty being to serve and please him. One translation defines a good woman in these words. Though he may be bereft of virtue, given to lust, and totally devoid of good qualities, a good woman should always worship her husband like a god. That is from the Manusmriti. Now, offensive as this sounds to our contemporary ears, doesn't this attitude still survive and even flourish in various degrees in our culture today? Our male-inspired cultural practices have come out of this sexist frame of mind. Has there ever been any cultural practice more inhuman and barbaric than sati? No husband was ever burned alive on his wife's dead body. This duty was reserved for wives. And as far as other punishments are concerned, we have never heard of a man being stoned to death for adultery. And of course, female infanticide and fetal killing have been common, and they still go on. The heavy hand of male dominance and male superiority is ingrained and embedded as a divine right in the mindset that has been imposed upon our people, making women inferior beings according to the laws laid down by men. And the laws which this authority lays down for Dalits in the caste system must be as offensive and obnoxious since Ambedkar and E.V. Ramasamy Periyar both publicly burnt the Manusmriti in the 1920s. I will now come to what women are up against today in the background of this ingrained mindset, which now has the backing of religious fundamentalism. There is no greater danger to the meaning of religion than when it is made use of as a weapon of war. When it takes this turn and becomes militant, it loses the right to be called religion. It becomes political policy for national purposes. In this garb, it has been the most divisive and destructive force in history. And this happened in Europe in the 16th century's religious wars, Catholic against Protestant, based on an intolerance of religious differences. But it was an intolerance that had more to do with an assertion of political power and pressure than with religion. And this is the mindset that is at work in India today which rejects religious differences and calls for a single national religion. 
Again, it is the rising graph of rapes which shows us the way this demand is affecting Indian women. Rape is nothing new. It happens in the home, within what is known as the sanctity of marriage. And stories of mass rapes in shelter homes have been coming to us. All this is happening in peacetime. And it has always been a weapon of war. But what we are seeing today is a valorization of rape and a justification of rape, as happened with the mass rapes by Pakistan's armies when they invaded East Bengal during the war for Bangladesh, or in the atrocities during the partition. And now we are looking at the same phenomenon here of rape and murder of a particular community. The intention being to alter the population figures. In this case, by cutting down the Muslim population figures. We are looking at religious fundamentalism in its modern meaning assisted in places by the use of modern technology. A beginning was made with the massacre of mainly Muslims in Gujarat in 2002. And now, of course, we keep hearing of assaults and assassinations. Now, these assaults have several features in common. They are without exception well organized. They are often committed by gangs. They do not spare children or infants or unborn babies. And when possible, the families of victims are also killed. They are also, without exception, accompanied by prolonged and horrific torture. And these have been described. In fact, we've seen such attacks on men uh, on TV. And otherwise, they have been described by some of the women who have gone through them and survived, told to investigators who have taken up their cases. And they are so horrifying that I will spare you the details by not reading out the women's testimonies that have come to light. So there's a pattern to these events. I should add that this inhumanity has long targeted Dalits and tribals. As writers like Mahashweta Devi and Kiran Nagarkar and others have shown us so vividly in their unforgettable fiction. Hindus who will not support such acts or such an ideology have also been targeted. And there are instances of non-Muslim Indians who at risk to themselves have tried to protect their Muslim neighbors. Yet another fact that is common to the attacks on Muslim men and women by those who have been indoctrinated in fundamentalism is that they have not been regarded as crimes. If we look at the official and in general the public silence about them and at what happens when justice is sought by victims or their families in these cases, typically there has been delay or no action by the police in acknowledging that they took place or in arresting the criminals who have been named by their victims. And in some cases, victims have been threatened with punishment if they name names. And there are even cases of the families of murdered victims being held responsible for the crimes committed upon them or against them. The police have also suppressed 
or tampered with evidence. And in some cases, the indifference of witnesses in the villages and towns where mob violence has taken place have made convictions difficult or impossible. And then, standing out from the general official silence, there has been the very vocal support of well-known legislators for these crimes. Well, I've said that these features, these are features that are common to the crimes committed by the fundamentalist mindset. And I will enumerate these from one case, which is now very well known, of Bilkis Bano, because it has all these features. It attracted great public attention because of the extraordinary persistence and courage of this young survivor of incredible brutality. As the only survivor and eyewitness of a massacre that took place, she went on fighting for justice. On the 3rd of May, in 2002, in a post Godhra riot, rioted area of Ahmedabad, Bilkis Bano and her family, 17 of them, were in a truck. They were trying, like thousands of Hindu and Muslim families, to escape to a safer place. When a mob attacked the truck, Bilkis was 19 years old. She had a two-year-old daughter, and she herself was five months pregnant. Her daughter was smashed to death on a rock. The female members of her family were gang-raped and killed. Altogether, 14 of her family were murdered. Bilkis herself was stripped and gang raped by 12 men and left to die. She recovered consciousness hours later and she saw her family's dead bodies lying all around her. She covered herself with what clothes she could find and she went looking desperately for help and shelter. She found shelter finally with a tribal family who were frightened for themselves, but they took her in. And later, when she saw a police van, she begged for protection, and she was taken to a police station. There, she lodged a complaint, and she gave the names of her rapists. The police refused to accept the names. And they told her that if she spoke out, she would be taken to a government hospital and given a poisonous injection. They then falsified her evidence and made her put her thumbprint on it. Her complaint was dismissed, and her case was closed for want of evidence. Later, she went to the National Human Rights Commission for help, and they backed her petition in the Supreme Court. The court ordered a CBI inquiry, shifted the trial of her case from Gujarat to Mumbai, and then the bodies of her family members were exhumed and examined. Finally, 14 years after the slaughter, 13 of the 20 men that she had accused, including the police who had falsified her evidence, and the two doctors who had suppressed evidence in the postmortems, were found guilty. And 11 of them were given life sentences for rape and murder. The 12th rapist had died. Well, the verdict was delivered on the 4th of May last year, 2017. Vrinda Grover, human rights activist 
and senior advocate at the Supreme Court. She has pointed out that the conviction of the policemen and the doctors who were found guilty showed, and I quote, that there was institutional state complicity in sexual violence, unquote. Bilkis, meanwhile, had been under threat of attack. She had had to keep changing her place of residence for her own safety. But she had refused to give up her search for justice. Well, fanaticism of this selective kind, which targets a particular community, has not been confined to India. It took place during the civil war in Yugoslavia in the 1990s in a highly organized manner. Muslim women from Bosnia, Albania, and Croatia were kept confined in camps where Christian Serbs raped them. This selectivity here, as in Yugoslavia or elsewhere, has a specific purpose. It is aimed at ethnic cleansing, and it is part of a policy to alter population figures by denying a particular community the right to exist. The persecution of the Rohingyas is also a case in point, along with the rape of Rohingya women that has been going on in, in uh, Myanmar. All these examples come under the label of crimes against humanity. And these are now being committed in India. The term was first used in the Nuremberg trials after World War II. And it was defined as follows, and I'm quoting, a deliberate act, typically as part of a systematic campaign that causes human suffering or death on a large scale, unquote. The International Criminal Court at The Hague has said that these crimes against humanity include murder, torture, sexual violence, persecution against a group, and other acts causing injury to body or to mental or physical health. They can be committed by non-state groups or paramilitary forces or individuals in peacetime or wartime, either as part of government policy or condoned by a government. It is important that such crimes have been recognized and labeled by international law, since many governments around the world have denied that any such thing has happened in their countries. Well, this year's Nobel Peace Prize has recognized sexual violence and rape as a war crime, since it is a feature of armed conflict. Well, one of the cases of crimes against humanity, which our own government and, and our public have not acknowledged, or taken steps to provide relief or justice to the sufferers, is the mob attack on Christians 10 years ago in Kandhamal. That killed more than 100 Christians, destroyed their homes, schools, churches, and made thousands of them homeless. Similarly, the United States has never acknowledged the outbreak of lynchings of black Americans in the American South in the early part of the 20th century. What makes people behave in this way? What makes such crimes possible? How can they be committed on this scale and repeatedly and then be brushed aside or forgotten? 
or treated as justifiable? This is an interesting question politically and psychologically for us to think about in view of what is happening here. A philosophy professor at Yale University, Dr. Jason Stanley, has made a study of why and how such a situation of intolerance and right-wing extremism has arisen in different countries across the world and is making itself felt today. He's written about in a book called How Propaganda Works, and a second book which I think might have been published by now called How Fascism Works. He says that first the ground has to be prepared so that a mood can be created that makes hatred and violence acceptable to society. And there is a standard formula by which this is accomplished. And it is a formula that is common to all such breakdowns of democracy, wherever they have occurred and are now occurring. And the method is as follows. Number one, the values of liberty and equality have to be replaced by authority and hierarchy. Hierarchy, which is ethnic or religious or gender-based. The dominant group, which means the majority community, has to be made to feel that it is being victimized by minority groups. This is what builds up a mood of hysteria against minorities and against socialism and communism. In this atmosphere, the nation's leader and the military are glorified, and dissenters are treated harshly. Secondly, the truth has to be destroyed. And this is done by spreading a fear of so-called outsiders and so-called enemies of the state. And this is done by appealing to emotions and cutting out all rational debate. Conspiracy theories are manufactured and an irrational fear is let loose. And when this happens, there is a complete breakdown of the truth. A myth has taken its place. And this is how Professor Stanley describes the myth that replaces the truth. He says, it is the myth of a glorious bygone era where the nation was supposedly ethnically or religiously pure and rural patriarchal values reigned supreme. That's the myth. Well, Outgroups are represented as threats to the dominant culture, and its men are cast as criminals or sexual predators." Unquote. Well, this myth places one ethnic group over others. It places men over women, and it places all opposition as anti-national. On this well-prepared ground, the mood that has been built up in society sanctions all kinds of behavior that would not be acceptable otherwise. And obviously, then, there is no place for liberty, equality, or democracy, or the give and take of democratic politics. Well, in a chilling conclusion, the professor says, Quote, history shows that such propaganda <coughs> licenses extreme brutality. One recent example about a month ago came from Germany, where, where a Syrian migrant was attacked by three men in a park and whipped with an iron chain. 
and Germany has seen the biggest riot against outsiders in 26 years, where the rioters have given the Hitler salute and hurled missiles. So Hitler worship now celebrates the most terrible era in Germany, German history. I think what should deeply disturb us is how accurately Professor Stanley's analysis explains what's happening here. At a time when human rights are in such poor shape in India, let me acknowledge the debt that we owe to the contribution of an Indian woman, Hansa Mehta, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There was no such concept as human rights at all until the end of the Second World War. And for the non-Western world, with large chunks of it under colonial rule, there was no question of any rights at all. It was because of the atrocities committed during the Second World War and during the period leading up to it that the concept was finally addressed. Hansa Mehta had been one of the 15 women who had helped to shape the Indian constitution. And it was her absolute insistence on sexual equality that influenced the language of our constitution. She had been a trailblazer in the field of women's rights in India and had been part of a committee to draft the Hindu Code Bill, which, as we know, was a major reform after independence, and it had a major impact on women's lives. As a delegate to the UN Commission on Human Rights in 1947-48, it was Hansa Mehta who changed the phrase all men are born free and equal to all human beings are born free and equal. Well, it took a woman to realize that this change of wording was crucial if whole societies were to be shaken out of masculine dominance. And to go further back, it is the determined struggle of Indian women reformers fighting for equality since the 19th century onward, not just for women's rights, but against the cruelties and injustices of caste that has brought us to where we stand today. And of course, the fight is far from over. Under religious fundamentalism, the minorities here are feeling hunted. The poor and helpless among them some of whom have been driven out of their villages and homes and jobs, live in terror. And India is no longer safe for its women. I have spoken as a Hindu, and I am one of millions of Indians of different faiths who practice their different religions. At independence, our founding fathers had the wisdom to respect this diversity and to declare India secular and democratic. Democracy to guarantee equal citizenship with equal rights and secularism to provide the space and fresh air for the practice of all religions and different ways of life and thought. No other nation in the world gave its people democracy before development, or its women the right to vote at the very start of nationhood. And no other country has achieved the multicultural miracle that is the meaning of Indian civilization. There is no room for religious fundamentalism among us. It is an insult to religion. It is a danger to all who disagree with it. And it is a frontal attack on our constitution. Thank you for listening.
Thank you so much, Ms. Segal, for a very insightful and <coughs> shocking statistical speech. May I now request Chief Justice Menon to come up and say a few words. Good evening, Justice Sikri, Ms. Nantara Segal, Mr. Bhandari, Justice Lalit, Mr. Manmohan Singh, gentlemen, ladies, and law students present. 33 years back, around about 1985, when I started as a young lawyer in Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh, I used to hear about a judge in the Delhi High Court, Justice Sunanda Bhandari. <laughs> the work she does as a judge in the High Court, the manner she dispenses justice to the needy, and stories about her husband, an eminent politician, and a member of the parliament at that point of time. Never did I, in my dream 33 years back, think that a day will come when I'll be here in Delhi and would be presiding over a lecture on behalf of that eminent lady. I'm really honored, privileged, and touched by the gesture shown by Mr. Bhandari in having invited me and given me this opportunity to preside over this lecture today. I am thankful to you, Mr. Bhandari, from the core of my heart. I understand that the foundation organizes this lecture every year, and this is the 23rd lecture we had heard today from none other than an eminent journalist, a writer, and a thinker, Ms. Nantara Segal. I have not met Justice Bhandari, but I have read her judgments, I have heard about her, and know how a brilliant judge she was. I found that she was a compassionate human being, a person of indomitable spirit who throughout her life worked relentlessly for the cause of women's right and for right of the deprived sections of the society. Justice Bhandari believed that women should first empower themselves through education so that she is able to seek her right on gender equalities. Though through her several landmark judgments, Justice Bhandari dealt with the issues of women empowerment. Such was her passion for work that she kept working and delivering judgments till her final moments. Her commitment to her duty as a judge was narrated to me very recently by some of my colleagues. I was told that even when she was in acute pain towards the later part of her life, she requested her colleagues to write a judgment in a case heard by three of the judges. One of them politely declined on the ground that he had not made the complete notes. The other one said that we will refer it to a larger bench. Justice Bhandari thought that we have heard the case Long time has passed, and in the interest of the litigant, to avoid delay, she, in that acute pain, wrote a 78 judgments deciding the case. I am also apprised of the fact that she was a profound lover of art, and despite her preoccupation with judicial work, she would manage to do her household course herself and was passionately committed to her family completely 
as any woman do, would do in a normal course. We have heard Ms. Nantara Segal, her views, and she has spoken about how the rights of a woman are to be protected. Indian courts have tried to ensure gender justice to women in some of the matters which have been reported recently. However, the fact remains that due to financial constraint and other compelling circumstances, all matters relating to gender equalities and gender bias do not get reported before the court as a consequence of which a vulnerable section of the woman suffer in silence. It is now our duty by helping these people to get justice by our intervention. While legislation and judicial intervention have gone a long way in ensuring rights to women, however, until and unless the orthodox and conservative mindset does not change, real justice would elude the woman. We are required to work collectively towards mitigating the hardship being faced by women in our society, and we need to remind ourselves that the status enjoyed by men in the society is not at all threatened if women get their right. I conclude my ex by expressing my profound gratitude to the Foundation for having me here, and I appreciate their efforts in organizing the lectures series every year, and I think it would go a long way in underlining the importance of issue relating to such a topic today. Thank you. Nantara ji, Justice Sikri, Just, Chief Justice Menon, Manmohan Singh ji, Gursharan ji, Miss uh, Kiran and James Valais of the Nas Foundation, friends. My mother had dreamt of an egalitarian society where every woman and man would have the freedom to choose and the right to excel. In fact, that is the motto of our foundation also. The best way to tri pay tribute to her memory is to work hard to translate her dream into reality. I thank Nentara ji for delivering the 24th Justice Sunanda Bhandari Memorial Lecture on a very important topic, women under religious fundamentalism. Thank you for delivering a thought-provoking and enlightening lecture. We are privileged to have Justice Sikri with us here today. Your warm words about my mother have given us an insight of her as a judge. Thank you. We are also indebted to Honorable Chief Justice Menon for presiding over to today's function. I offer my sincere thanks to all of them for sparing their valuable time for the foundation and being here with us today. I also offer my sincere thanks to the members of the NAS Foundation who are here with us. And I applaud them and I, I, I congratulate them for the work that they continue to do. <laughs> Thanks are also due to our friends from the media who have always supported the foundation. And of course the IIC, which has always been now for many years our venue for the lecture and they have always been very, very helpful and very, very cooperative. Last but not the least, I must thank you all for coming here today and keeping my mother's memory alive. Thank you.